And welcome, my friend. Hey, hey, hey. What's good, my brother? What's good? <laughs> What's good? So, Mr. Patrick Rosella, would you please open it up with a little performance for us? Yes, sir. Let's get it popping. <laughs> Uh, yeah, huh, yeah, uh From the third world back into the belly of the beast We're bridging gaps like dental flossing through the teeth The time is now, the play is foul enough to get our folks Marching in the streets, educating, organizing, mobilizing the repeat My peoples, if you're feeling this, get up over your feet Let's dance to the movement, boogie down up in the streets Overworking just to get to barely paying off the rent So that change inside your pockets gonna stay getting spent When my anger gets a building, then I'm guided by the people Focusing the energy like voice into the speaker David Fagan breaking off a part of all these barriers Like Bata on death, marches carry on the shoulders Miseducation, no relation to the issues Third world liberation, front into the center But we're still struggling for any type of recognition It's the youth and all the elders got the keys into ignition Uh, yeah Power to the people, and this is the power to the people Power to the people, now it's power to the people Uh, yeah Ipagpatuloy pa ang laban from the time of Datu Lapu Organizers katipunan They tell us take a moon but we gotta get some moving Workers teaching students, we're pushing for improvement Export and labor but they're really training humans If that don't sound familiar then I really can't blame you We gotta take two so we can get to building Taking the tradition to dismantle propositions Bet on taking all the land just to set a big business Pork barrel scandals handing funds to politicians Economic policy Based on the remittance, now you wonder why conditions got the people hella agit. It's simple mathematics. Three basic problems trapping 99%. One, keep on pushing till our backs against the fence. Countless human rights violations in effect, but you could never take away the people's right to self defense. Brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Um, th- you know, that was a time when I was in uh, the organization uh, Legal Filipino Students at San Francisco State. I was also part of uh, PACE or the Filipino American Collegiate Endeavor. So at that time, I was getting um, a lot of like my political education from some of the folks in the LFS. And they were, you know, exposing me to a lot of the issues that were going on in the Philippines, from issues of landlessness to um, extrajudicial killings carried out by um, the government, um, the uh, plight of uh, indigenous people mm. in the countryside. Um, and, you know, the way I kind of wanted to, you know, with this piece, what I kind of wanted to do was, um, you know, related back to a lot of the problems that we have as Filipinos here in the U.S. also. I mean, a lot of the times, I think one of the big issues that always come to mind is like our identity. Um, And when it comes to our identity, um, we're we're stripped of that because of the colonial history and the colonial relationship between the U.S. and the Philippines. And um, through this piece, you know, I guess like at the time I was pretty angry, you know. Um, You know, I think it's still it's still definitely something that's agitating. But um, I think, you know, through my anger and through my agitation, um, that that's how that piece came to be, really highlighting a lot of the problems um, that are happening in the Philippines and how it connects to um, like us here in the U.S., Filipinos in the U.S. So just a general question, like you said that that was the time when you got politicized and it got you angry. Um, were you not aware of issues or things like that before joining LFS? Mm. Uh, and what was your like exposure <clears throat> to like the Philippines? To- yeah, I think definitely um, I didn't know too much about what was going on in the Philippines at the time, but I was, um, you know, I, I was aware of what was going on here in the U.S. Mm. Um, I think what I've always been looking for was like a group or an organization um, that could, um, you know, kind of anchor, like, um, those issues and, like, you know, if they would have a more uh, systemized way of, like, talking about these problems. Because I, I think for me, what I've always wanted to look for was a community because um, I come from Pittsburgh, California, not Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, if you need reference, uh, you can look at the BART train where uh, the Pittsburgh Bay Point line, where the yellow line, so... That's where I'm from. I think that's where Dante Bosco is from yes. also. Yes, Dante right? Bosco is from Pittsburgh, okay, California. Okay, okay, P-Town. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, when I look at other um, other cities, particularly like in San Leandro or uh, San Jose, Union City, um, San Francisco, Daly City, they have a lot of different Filipino youth programs that talk to them about um, a lot of the issues from not knowing your identity to what's happening in the community with uh, gentrification uh, to, um, you know, what's going down in the Philippines with, like, indigenous people's schools mm. that they're building because of uh, government neglect. Um, so for me, it, I think I've always been conscious or aware of what was going on. It was more so me just trying to find, like, a more organized way of um, going about it. Mm. Were you exposed to, mm-hmm. like... Filipino American organi- organizations in Pittsburgh when you're coming up? Mm, nah, I mean, how I really got a lot of my stuff was um, when I was um, in middle school. Um, excuse me, hold on. Uh, when Is that I, fire? <laughs> <laughs> Is that North Bay fire? No. <laughs> I got too much apoy in my lungs. Um, That's why you spit fire, bro. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, um... Like yeah, when uh, when I was in middle school, there was a point where I kind of wanted to join a gang because a lot of a lot of my other friends were joining a gang. Mm. But then I had an uncle um who found out and got pretty pissed because mm. my uncle used to be part of or I don't know if he was actually part of a gang, but I know he he hung out with a lot of uh, the Filipino gangs in Pittsburgh in the nineties. Mm. Um, and when he had found out, he was like, "Dude, like you shouldn't like be throwing your life away with that stuff. What you need to do is uh." Learn and understand why your family came here in the first place. Mm. You got to ask uh, your Lola, your mom, your dad, your Lolo, your Amang, everybody in the family. You know, ask them why they came here. And, um, you know, from there, you know, it kind of put a different perspective for me. And it kind of, you know, it, I, I think that was a, a, a turning point in my, in my life as a youth. Because um, from there, um, you know, that's, that, even without any Filipino organizations... I was able to like figure out what my family history was, um, 
all my school reports and stuff would be about like Jose Rizal, yeah, uh, the Katipunan, uh, Gabriela Silang, how uh, Lapu Lapu uh, stopped uh, Ferdinand Magellan. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that's a, that's a lot of like what my my schoolwork would center around in regards to like different reports. Were there a lot of Filipinos in your neighborhood? Uh, where where I'm situated at in in Pittsburgh, um, I think I'm more in the end where there are a lot of uh, black folks and uh, Latino folks. Mm. Um, but like in Pittsburgh, there's definitely a big presence of Filipinos out there. So let me do like a little speed round. All right, just speed answers, just so I can get like an overview mm -hmm. also of your history and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, where were you born? Uh, Walnut Creek, California. When did you move to Pittsburgh? Um, my, my family has been there like since the early 90s. Mm. So I've always lived in Pittsburgh. And is that where you went to elementary <clears throat> school, like middle school and all? Uh, no, I actually went to school um, all, my, all, my, all my life, um, K through 12. I was uh, at school in Concord, California. Oh, yeah. is that far from Pittsburgh? No, it's about like a 15, 20 minute drive, depending on traffic. What high school? Uh, I went to Ignacio Valley High School. Ignacio Valley yeah. High School. And then um, where do you go to college? Uh, for college, I went to uh, San Francisco State San University. San Francisco State Gators. E. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, other than LFS, what other orgs were you part of there? Yeah, I was uh, part of PACE, um, the Filipino American Collegiate Endeavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just those two. <laughs> and then weren't you part of Mulasa Ugat? Um... I mean, I was like a representative um, as a as a member of PACE and LFS, mm. um, but MSU or Mulasa Ugat was more of a an alliance organization. Mm. So um, it was supposed to be an organization that's uh, run through the different um, organizations on campus. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then what did you study at state? Um, I studied political science and Asian American studies. Mm. Yeah. And then when did you graduate? I graduated um, winter 2016, yes. And so now where do you work? So right now I work at the Filipino Community Center. Yeah. Which is where, um, you know, when, when I was in college, I also interned there. Huh. So um, I had a, a lot of like different experiences um, from working with the youth program to, because uh, that was also the year when I interned in 2013. That was the year Typhoon Haiyan had hit. Mm. So um, I actually also did a lot of um, the coordinating for like the relief and donations. The task force high end, yeah, for the task force high end, yeah. and then that eventually led into KBKN, yeah, the yeah. Kapit Bisa Kabataan Network, yeah, which you ended up becoming regional coordinator, mm -hmm. yeah. And so now at the FCC, from what I know, you help co coordinate the uh, Kabataan, mm -hmm. yes. the high school youth mm -hmm. program. Cool. So you have a lot of like um, little hats, right? Also, uh, you, you technically, you also do have a lot of hats, bro. You, I do have a lot of hats. You have, you have a lot of hats. But I remember also meeting you when we would do open mics mm -hmm. um, up at State, too. Yeah. Um, uh, what was the one that was doing that? It was Speak? No, no. What was the... There was, was like, a lot of them. There was like, oh, uh, yeah, I mean... At least to LFS, we had like flip the script or FDS. Mm. Um, we there were definitely those speak open mics. Mm. Um, those were run through like the poetry organization. Mm. Um, that was there. Um, and I think you know, I think we were both like just like young artists who were looking for a place to like um, express ourselves. Mm. So I think we were just trying to latch on to anything and everything that we could find that was both in the arts and you know, I guess kind of Filipino. Um, community oriented also because I remember seeing you at a, at quite a few of the Ally open mics also mm, oh yeah, yeah. Ally the in progress yep. shout out <laughs> Excelsior that was the very first spot I did like a poem in oh, public word. I believe if I remember right it was like the first love poem and then oh, snap. I was like oh <laughs> what is I'm gonna be so so romantic and shit <laughs> and then yeah that was it's kind, kind of crazy to think about the the impact that community events can have mm -hmm. on individuals and creating spaces for people to even try mm -hmm. to perform, to go up is very impactful, right? And 
it also makes me think about our responsibility now as yep. older folks mm-hmm. to create those spaces for the youngins, for people to just have a space for expression yep. or to pursue what they want, right? Um, but I want to kind of talk a little bit about KBKN. Mm, yeah. All right. Because um, your history, why don't you give me a little rundown about KBKN? So KBKN or the Kapit Bisig Kapataan Network, mm. um, it was a network that was formed in response to Typhoon Haiyan when it had hit in November 2013. Um, it started out initially as a, re- uh, a relief and rehabilitation um, network mm. that could provide for um, disasters struck in areas in the Philippines. Uh, but then through our different, um, through the three um, mission trips that we've held in the last three years, um, we come to understand that part of it is also intertwined with human rights and environmental justice. Mm. So um, in our aspect of what we meant through rehabilitation and relief, um, it goes just beyond distributing like food packs or clothes. Um, it goes beyond um, just the, the surface, um, or not, or not necessarily surface, but the immediate um, the immediate uh, relief. We're talking, for, for us, we really wanted to figure out um, some of the long-term um, type of relief that we could help contribute, you know, whether that would be like having projects that could contribute like different farming animals or um, farming tools such as tractors um, or even, because um, I know like we, we've tried to partner with the National Alliance for Filipino Concerns mm-hmm, before mm-hmm. also, um, you know, trying to like adopt a school that um, indigenous people in Mindanao were building um yeah there are there are a lot of things we were trying to figure out if i remember right because you went to the very first trip of kbkn mm-hmm. and that was the one with was that the one with connie with claire mm-hmm. yeah with kui pele yeah right could you flash me back to that first experience was that the first time you went on an exposure trip yeah that was my first time uh, going on an exposure trip let's jump back let's yeah. do a little flashback let's, let's take it back let's take it way back, back. back way back back it in was the time not as organized as <laughs> 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 give me a little like as a this is context now that now that we have context mm-hmm. right yeah. filipino american born here mm-hmm. right being politicized when you were in college even mm-hmm. if you had like some inklings of filipino history yeah. because rizal lapu lapu it's a different lens you're yeah. sa- you're sharing uh, once you joined lfs right mm-hmm. and going through college yeah and then this but this wasn't the first time back to the philippines nah, was nah. it this yeah. is my second time yeah. so you went with family your yeah. first time mm-hmm. and then this trip in was it 2013 2014 2014 yeah. was your first time on a community exposure trip mm-hmm. where it was built off in response to Haiyan mm-hmm. the largest at that time landed um what was that typhoon yeah right and so you're going also in your first time in like in a political lens, mm-hmm. right? Could you yeah. flash me back? What's your what's going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, one of my goals and expectations um, when I had went on the trip for the first time was like to really see and understand like the struggle of the Filipino people. Um, not in the sense to like you know do some sort of like you know just post it up on like social media and like be like oh all these people are poor and oppressed like oh look at them look at their lives you know it wasn't I, it wasn't about that tip i think it was really trying to understand why things were the way they are and like really informing um you know people here in the u.s that like yo these people are you know as 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 much as they've been struck in by uh by um natural disaster um and tragedy these people are able to take it upon themselves to uh, take care of themselves when nobody else would. And that shows to, um, you know, the experience of like, you know, understanding the resiliency of the Filipino people. Um, so for me, getting to sit down and chop it up with like um, elders in the community, even the children, like um, there was one uh, barangay in Samar that we had went to where um, they said, yeah, like, you know, the typhoon, um, you know, it didn't really destroy too many infrastructure here because we're covered by the canopy of the trees. Um, but what they did destroy was their livelihood, mm-hmm. um, which mm-hmm. is, um, 
like they they're coconut farmers so all the coconut products that they bring out from um that area they weren't able to have a livelihood for like almost six months and because of that they got into um extreme poverty i mean they're already poor but you know they didn't have um the resources to like uh, plant their crops um they weren't able to sustain themselves um you know and i think for us for our group we were like um the only group that came into contact with them six months after the typhoon had mm. hit and they were like no government support there was no like government that. support or nothing um so we were kind of like damn like you know like uh, these people are making ends meet in whatever term that they can in which you know it's still like you know trying to like make sure the community is cool um and to see that they were doing that without any type of assistance i mean in one part it was enraging but then on the other part it was like damn like these people are really self-reliant um and so that was like at a barangay in uh samar and it just like really blew me away because like you know we have this concept of bayanihan we have this concept of capua here in the u.s and um you know i think it's cool that we can learn it through like an academic lens mm. but to really see it play out in a concrete um social practice mm. was really like damn these people are really taking care of each other can you give examples of what you mean by like concrete social practice like what are these lived experiences of capua what does it look like so um some of these are uh, folks um they do communal farming mm. um they know and understand that like the land that they're in is rough and that there are some spaces where they can only plant so much. So what they do is they divide the labor, they divide the crops and distribute it um, as uh, equally as they can to those who are also need it the most in the other families. So for the children and the sick and elderly. Um, so they're able to like um, get the crops, the vegetables, uh, rice and fruits for them. Mm. Other folks would uh, focus on trying to, because they live near the river. Um, they would like try to get fish um, and uh, other aquatic animals that they could eat. Um, they would also share their livestock. Mm. Yeah. Just for context, too, like, could you share about what you actually do as a community exposureist? Like, what is the setup mm. of a community exposure? Mm. Like, is it just visiting? Is it what do you do? <coughs> Just to give a little context to like what your experience was like. Yeah. So um, for me in this particular trip, uh, what we were uh, doing is uh, just uh, you know, talking to the community members and seeing what their experiences are mm. as something that was primary. Um, but then we were also, um, you know, we helped uh, some of the children. We did a uh, psychosocial mm. uh, intervention, which is... Um, because the, these uh, these children had a lot of trauma from um, the typhoon and how it had hit, um, we um, we just played games with them to like de-stress them, um, because um, yeah, they, they legit thought like if the wind would like grow and blow really hard or if they heard thunder, they panicked mm -hmm. and like they would have anxiety attacks, and like we were like, dang, like you know, this is the impact of um, of a natural disaster. In a way that people don't really see it because we see the immediate destruction. But, um, well, what was it, you know? And what the typhoon focused on was the people of uh, Tacloban City. Mm. And, you know, that in, in fairness, it's because that was the hardest hit area. But at the same time, there are also those other areas that are not reached by the media, that are not reached by the government, that also need that help. Um, and then, um, the other part, um, we were also doing a uh, medical mission. I mean, I didn't partake in it because I was like, oh, I don't know how to do any of this shout stuff. Shout out, though, to the video I saw y'all on a video report of your trip. And shout out to Anna for doing circumcisions. Yeah, the turi turi. The, the turi. Yo, that shit crazy. Yeah. I saw the video. I was like, what? Are you? But it's necessary in yeah, some places. Is. Yeah. I was like, damn, yeah. that is exposure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, straight up. I mean, like you know parents that that was a service that yeah, um yeah. they were looking for yeah. so we were like ah oh, we'll provide that and then lastly um was also um distributing the relief packs mm. um which had like two weeks worth of food um soap 
Um, that's pretty much it. But what I want to highlight actually is during these KBKN trips, it's also not just a visit in the sense mm-hmm. that you'll drop in on the town and stay in a hotel mm-hmm. and all that. From my exposure to the other trips, it's you're staying within the community, mm-hmm. staying in people's homes and getting mm-hmm. to connect and talk with them, live to the capacity that their environment has, use yep. whatever restroom they have, if they even have one, mm-hmm. or if it's just a hole in the ground, yep. or even just open air, for you to actually experience like this lifestyle, right? What was that experience for you like coming from this filipino american perspective of like mm-hmm. yeah there's struggle here though it is realistically a first world right we're yeah. here and we're yeah. going jumping into another world over there yeah. i think for myself um because i i had talked and prepared with um a few of the folks who i know from lfs um you know they gave me some step by step you know how, how to prepare because mm-hmm. The first thing they straight up told me was, you are going to be uncomfortable. Um, you are going to have to do things that you probably don't normally have to do because you live um, in a place that has, like, you know, something that is as basic as, like, um, a sewer system or something as basic as running water. Um, I mean, for me, I, th- I think I was, like, you know, I was ready to embrace the challenge. I mean, I, I definitely felt, like, the impacts on my body. Um, but like, I, you know, I think I was like, oh no, yeah, this is, this is, it's hard to live like with no running water, no, no sewer system, um, having to like catch your own food, having to grow your own food, having to harvest your own food. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, that, that's what, I think that's what made this program, um, very special. Uh, because it really gave us the perspective of the of the of the everyday people's struggle, and like I don't know, for me, like it really helped me see and under uh, see and understand where my family came from. Because my family, um, on my mom's side, they were all farmers who were living mm-hmm. in the same conditions. Uh, you know, even in the urban centers, we were able. I mean, before. Um, we formally started the KBK admission trip. I did a, a few community integrations with some urban poor communities. And, you know, that showed me the conditions that my pops lived in when he was living in Pasay City mm. in the ghettos. And it was like, yo, these conditions are real. And like, you know, it it doesn't make me feel sorry for them. It doesn't make me feel like, oh, my God, like there's like what's wrong. I mean, of course, like, you know, it's it's a. It's a fucked up situation, but at the same time, to see these people surviving and um, taking it in a way in which they're able to um, exhibit their strength as a community, because these communities are so organized, um, you know, it really showed me like, yo, like we can do this here too in the U.S. Especially, you know, we have similar problems. They might be a little bit different because of the um, because of um, the way the systems are set up, but. I think the answer is like, yeah, we can organize our communities. We can uh, be self-reliant. Mm. Um, we can uh, partner with other um, marginalized communities here in the U.S. also. It really gave me that example and made me see that, um, you know, like when 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 we talk about activism in the way that it is, um, I think sometimes we have a limited scope when we see it here in uh, the U.S. Because sometimes folks only see activism as uh, rallying in the streets. Mm. But um, I think what what the Philippines showed me in their perspective of activism is, yeah, we can rally in the streets, but that's like a minor point of the work. The major point of the work is building those day-to-day relationships with the people, getting them, uh, getting them to like understand that the situation in the, that they're in is unjust, but that they themselves can get themselves out of it. And that's what like, I feel is so special about um, these KBKN mission trips. Mm. And so when you came back, is that when you um, became more active with KBKN in terms mm-hmm. of becoming regional coordinator? Yes. Like, can you give me a little rundown on with that reflection of the importance of that first trip? 
what was the experience coming back here? How did you integrate those lessons or mm -hmm. those reflections back into your life here? And how did that also inform your work with KBKN? Mm. You know, I think for me, um, I actually had a rough time when I came back. Mm. Um, you know, I think there was a point where, you know, I, I don't know if I would call it depression, but I mean, like, I feel like I was like pretty depressed for a long time. Um, a part of that was on me. Um, I would just keep things to myself and like I wouldn't really reach out for any help or anything or, you know, just someone to talk to about like why I'm feeling this way. Mm. Um, and a lot of it was spurred because of the experiences you had in the Philippines. Um, I mean, that was part of it, but then I guess it was also relating it to like people back here. Um, cause that, that was at a time also, um, yeah, I don't think I, I don't think I had enough time to like come back and like, just like, um, fully process things. Cause I just jumped into everything school. like for school and stuff. Mm. And so like that transition from like third world to first world really like, I was like, Oh man, I don't know how to handle this. Yeah. Um, and of course I, you know, I think I still carry those lessons with me, but I, I like, I think for that year, I just was like, I felt immobilized just because, um, I didn't know how to move forward with it. Hmm. And like, um, because I closed myself off and because, um, I wasn't like, you know, trying to challenge myself more to like, you know, even talk to friends, um, people who are in the organization, um, I think that was what, that was what was difficult for me in that first year after my first uh, trip. Um, but definitely after coming back, um, I think what I was trying to like practice was like really um, trying to form a regional group um, because I think at the time I think for the most part um, it was I was trying to carry out the work. Um, but I just didn't know how to do it. It was my first time doing mm -hmm. like regional work. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I don't know if this is right or if this is right. Um, so like, you know, I, I definitely feel like um, I have a lot of learning experience from that. Like, um, yeah, you know, sometimes people um, have different expectations of like what the network does. And this was, you were talking about regional work for Kapit PC Kabataan Network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was so like a sort of saving grace though in that time when it was hard for you to reintegrate back here, right? What kind of got you out of those depressed moments? Um, it was it was definitely like you know connecting with other people in a different um because at the time I was also head coordinator for Pace. Oh, so you had a um, lot on so your plate. I, I had yeah, a lot on my plate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um but like yeah, I think um definitely um you know, a, as much as I I wouldn't like reach out or like I would isolate isolate myself, I think because I was still in the space that requires me to socialize with people, um that was my saving grace. Like mm. you know, being with the community, um you know, like even feeling like, you know, if I don't want to get out of bed, if I don't want to talk to anyone, let me just like at least be in a community space so I can like just dig in the vibes here. Mm. And then those kind of got the momentum going just mm -hmm. being in those spaces. Yeah. Yo, that's beautiful. That's dope to hear just like placing yourself in certain spaces even if you're not internally feeling it, mm -hmm. it can help shift your vibe. Yeah. That's some like energy shit. <laughs> and then, so once you got it going, mm -hmm. you were doing work as the regional coordinator and that was in prep for the next year? Mm -hmm. Yes. For the 2016 trip mm -hmm. that we actually went on yeah. together. Okay, let's do a little flashback to that one. Let's, right. bring, let's bring it down. Can you give me a little input on your perspective going into your second trip now? Mm. Um, and what was what was that experience? Wait, when you came back though, you organized a trip that I went on, but you didn't go on, right? Mm, In twenty fifteen, not really. Um, I think part of that was like, um, it, I think it was like me and the homie JT. Um, I think he was taking care of your trip first, uh -huh, uh -huh. um, because like, um. He was someone who had experience going on the first trip also. Mm. But then I believe um he got busy because he was um he um he had a new job. Um and so that's when I when I got asked 
like after my term as head coordinator. So I, by that time already, y'all were already kind of like prepared and stuff. And so like it was more so like when when y'all came back when I was like, okay, now I can like try to transition and see if I can help y'all out with like your report backs and stuff. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just timeline: you went on the first KBKN trip, which mm-hmm. was 2014. Yep. And then you helped us with the reintegration in 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, but you didn't go on that trip. But you went in 2016. Yes. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Damn, we're old, bro. <laughs> no, 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 no. We got the heart of the youth. Heart Time of the youth. flies, bro. No, no, no. We got the heart of the youth. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, was a bata sa loob, bro. You, you, you. Um, <laughs> or isip bata. <laughs> um, so 2016. Mm-hmm. Okay. This was your second time on a exposure trip. Mm-hmm. What was your kind of perspective going into it now? And mm-hmm. taking into account that you were one of the heads, the yeah. regional coordinator yeah. and being a team lead and all. I mean, originally I wasn't even supposed to go on this trip. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's all good. Um, like I, I got asked a, a bit last minute. Yeah. Um, Cause like uh, there were other exposure groups that were going, but then um, the original person who was supposed to team lead us, um, they had to prioritize another trip already. So uh, for myself, um, they had, like the, the other expo leaders doing the different missions had asked me if I could do it. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I guess I can. Um, I mean, uh, you know, they were asking like, you know, three weeks before their, everyone was going to go to the Philippines. But then for me also, I was like, you know, I have a flexible, I have a flexible job that will take me back. Um, I have something to come back to. So it's like, it's not like I'm not going to have a job or anything when I get back. Um, my family will understand, like, this is an organizational thing. So, like, you know, I, I, for me, it was easier to plug in. So um, I had went, um, and we were, you know, our trip, we traversed through uh, Central Luzon, uh, the Eastern Visayas. And uh, we had different, because we were broken up into different groups uh, for the last leg, um, parts, we were in different parts of Mindanao. Mm. But you and I were in Sambuanga. So. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, yo, this trip, um, it was gnarly, um, cause it gave me a really full scope on like, um, like the condition, like, you know, I think it's all, you know, when we talk about like a lot of the conditions that are happening in the Philippines and things that are translated to here, mm. um, it's always on a national scope and, you know, I understand like it's hard to cover all the regions, but, um, when we were able to go to central Luzon, Eastern Visayas, and some Bwanga and see what the particular problems were mm. and how it related to a lot of the national issues that were going on. Mm. Um, I was like, oh dang. That's gnarly. Like Okay, let's get let's get into this. What first let's break it down. What were the national issues mm. that you see as the overarching mm-hmm. problems? Yeah, so um definitely part of it is a uh, genuine land reform mm. uh, to get um land for uh the landless tillers and then um national industrialization Mm. um there is no national industrialization in the philippines Mm. so um you know how that connected in um in central luzon we had um the aita tribes or the indigenous people in the area who were potentially going to be pushed out of the area because of uh an aggressive development called clark green city uh being prioritized to be built there and it was built in a way where it was very, like, it would take away the land from um, the farmers and the landlords. I mean, it was, like, in a way, because, like, naturally, like, the landlords and uh, the land tillers, the farmers, um, they always have disputes because um, they're, the, the landlords are taking the land. But in this case, there was a special case because their, their land was going to be taken by um, the the companies that were pushing the Clark Green City. Mm-hmm. So um, they actually united and were like, the, the landlord and the farmers united and we were like, yo, we're, we're not going to let you take the land. Like, this is our land. Uh, we have the right to cultivate it and it's not right for y'all to push us off. It was crazy to see the 
official policy mm-hmm. that allowed, quote unquote, technically allowed, right, yeah. legalize the land acquisition mm-hmm. through official decrees. I remember it was the BCDE, right, yeah. Basis Conversion Development mm-hmm. Act and Authority, mm-hmm. right, that was taking land from the farmers in specific areas where they were. I remember that letter that was given to a farmer mm-hmm. to one of the landowners saying, "Hey, we're gonna give you." 30 pesos per hectare, Mm -hmm. I believe. And then I was talking to my pops who knows the market rate was like 300 Mm -hmm. per hectare or something at least like that. So really just taking it through these official decrees like hand in hand with Mm -hmm. development using public policy to legitimize the taking of land. Mm -hmm. And it was a trip just to see that kind of cooperation. Yeah. Right. At the expense of people working the land mm-hmm. and making it um, bountiful and making yeah. it productive. And then the other part that was a trip too. Um, it was like they would legit. Yeah, they would. They would print out these. Um, remember they would. So because a lot. Of, a lot of the. A lot of the um, farmers. Um, they don't. They 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 haven't received formal education. Mm. Um, but you know they can read and understand the Galog. But like um you know this how they intend how um those companies uh presenting the forms um how they would just intentionally like uh, write them out in English they're like they couldn't mm. understand it mm. um so like they you know and then the way that they would go about it they'd be like oh just just sign off on it we'll get you money you know hello like shady and stuff mm. um and then the other part too with um the fisher folk communities that were able to visit you know the mining companies um destroying the mountains and uh contaminating the waters through their open pit mining mm. um you know where's the where's the national development for that like um filipinos are not even able to garner the resources that are theirs it's being taken by uh foreign uh mining companies so it's like you know not only are you taking you know like you're you're you're, you're really taking the resources and destroying the livelihood of people there and even the environment yeah. for the people living in the area. I remember one of the things they were saying is that because of the mining, it destroys the protection of the roots mm-hmm. that prevent landslides. Yeah. And so there were landslides in a certain area, a death or f- a few of those, but also contamination of their farmland. Yeah. Remember, I think we were talking to one family saying that they would see the red soil because mm-hmm. of the nickel. Yeah. Was it? That would just come down after rain. Yeah. And well, Anna, they're farming yeah. their farmland, the their crops, crops are destroyed. Would be destroyed. Yeah. And they have nothing, they can't do anything because it's official, it's yeah. legal, yeah. right? Because it's allowed. Yeah. But who sits at the top to authorize mm-hmm. these mining developments is not necessarily the re- the real representatives of the people in that area. Yeah. That was, that's fucking like, you're sitting there and you're like, can't believe that this is happening. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, what? what? Is this real? Is this real life? Is this like how it's and you realize that's how it's been going yeah. on. Yeah. And that's what's the, and that's what's the trip. It's like, damn, this has been happening like five ever. Five ever. True. And it's all legal too, quote unquote. Yeah. Right. So my sister always um or has this picture too, like legality does mm-hmm. not necessarily mean it's right. Yeah. Like the picture that she has on her Facebook is like apartheid was legal, slavery was legal. These things that we we point to the law saying that it's that's the law, but is it really protecting the people that it affects? Yep. What was the exposure uh, for you in uh, Visayas? We went to uh, to Samar. Yep. We went to Kanbagdik. Yep. Shout out. Shout out to Kanbagdik. Shout out to uh, El Buterte. Uh, Kuya Pat. <laughs> I, I forgot Kuya, his Kuya, name. Kuya. Was Kuya. What? Buterte? Bu- Buter. <laughs> Buter. Uh, shout out to um, uh, Kuya B-Boy. Uh, oh, yeah. So we went to a community in Kanbagdik. Mm-hmm. This is in Western Samoa. Yes. Right. 
and then they were a farming community mm -hmm. and then these names that you're mentioning were the youth yeah that were just all around us for yeah. the time that we were staying in the community mm -hmm. if i remember what struck me was we stayed at the houses of people who were leading organizations there mm -hmm. yeah. right the right next to each other they yeah. were all part of a farming community organization mm -hmm. that collectivized and organized like a communal garden mm -hmm. right and then the Araglayon where they work on each other's farms mm -hmm. on a weekly basis right well like this week we'll work on your farm next week you'll we'll work on my farm next week we'll work on john's farm yeah that was crazy to yeah. just see what was your experience and like takeaways during that trip Ooh. that section of it it's like dang the level of like organization and coordination to be able to do that mm. shows how rich their experience is in carrying out how to do collective work uh community work and it's like oh my god i was like just like amazed i was like dang y'all are like on like level 100 we're like on like level two it's <laughs> <laughs> true you know what i remember right now to be like the president or officers in their organization you had to quit your vices do you remember that conversation yeah, they yeah. couldn't smoke they couldn't the drink they couldn't be a womanizer yep. it was strictly their rules yeah like the expectation that they had for these leaders was high because mm -hmm. there was a lot of responsibility and a lot of trust placed onto you. Yeah. We should bring that to our freaking organizations here. Oh, yeah, yeah, we should do that, you know? <laughs> That's like, it's, it's like, it's almost the organizing there is a necessity of life. Yes. Rather than a like, oh, yeah, let's just, let's join this org and mm -hmm. see what's up. Right, it's more. It's not. It's not to pad their resume. Let me yeah. say that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's definitely. for their kids to have food. Yep. And in order to survive. Yeah. Right. To collect and to find some real unity, like yeah. collective action and solidarity. Yeah. You know, like I think I think for me, like um, oh that it w it was just like you know even when one of our uh one of our uh, uh team members um got hurt right mm -hmm. it was like dang they they even are like you know accommodating to us like mm -hmm. you know we're coming into their communities um you know where you know you know i hope we didn't mess up any of their plants when we were like <laughs> helping them weed it out i'm pretty sure we did yo that planting was hard we they could tell the difference between rice between a weed between ginger and then there was a bunch of different yeah. um plants that were all like planted in the same area yeah so you had to know which one is which to act it took a while but i got it eventually yeah. i think we all got we all, like all the difference got it. between the rice the palai and the weed like yeah and they look so similar yeah but you just have to find the little nuance like of the little grain and this and that but i remember when we first started i was like is this a, is this is this a weed is it <laughs> yeah dude like <laughs> no yeah that one that one i bet they're like <laughs> these kids yo but their their life like was dope yeah just to see them like living and existing there yeah and the youth were dope the youth were very loving and like i remember who was the older one the there was one kid who like looks me in the eye right and he's like i was too late i was circumcised at the river at seven or something right <laughs> he goes he got the the wood and the bolo and he cut it off i did not cry <laughs> i was like i was like shit damn he was like i had no tears damn i would have been tearing up if that hey, the story got me tearing up right now <laughs> <laughs> and i remember the ginger mm when it was brought by the local government unit yes given to the community quote-unquote donated mm -hmm. but it was all rotten ginger mm -hmm. like moldy and everything but in comparison when you were saying that they took care of us i remember i got sick a little bit they made us uh, lagundi tea like straight from the um tree itself gave us ginger the best ginger <sighs> i've ever had the strongest yo. ginger i've ever had yo, yo. i haven't tried 
any ginger at all close to that strength yeah and it healed me up yo and then the best avocado yeah remember that one it was like, red right it was red but then i remember every time when menchi had it clarissa like tasted it brought to their mouth their their eyes were like what the fudge they couldn't <laughs> believe that it tasted that good and creamy like fuck chipotle and your ad two dollars <laughs> for your guac y'all ripping us off because that ain't real avocado like we had the the plants the life was just like abundant mm -hmm. but it was beautiful to see also the collective work in order for them to survive yeah do you remember the story about the the strafing of the bullets of the remember the farmers oh, yeah for the one koya ario story was that was that yeah koya ario yeah, you want to yeah. tell it you want to share it and your thoughts on it i mean um because koya ario um he's one of the main organizers right now for um for the farming organization that was in that community um and because at the time he was conducting relief with uh people surge which is a uh, people's organization that sprung up after um typhoon yolanda had hit um, he was helping organize um, and try to get relief for the community uh, because they're a bit further from the downtown area. Um, so um, because of his organizing efforts, um, he was being red tagged as a member of the New People's Army. Hmm. Um, and so when he was in town um, just trying to buy groceries for his family or I, I forget if it was like groceries or like medicine um, for like one of his daughters. But um, when he was found by um, when when he was like uh seen by like suspected like um government intel, like they started chasing him and trying to shoot at him, and like the way that he had to escape um he he jumped into the river and swam, and like he just ran as fast as he could, and like he was able to like hide and dodge them. It was kind of crazy just to like hear these real life action stories of like people who are struggling and then mixed in with the dynamics of like political tagging and just like obstacles to them actually living just a steady life. Yeah. Because the story that I was remembering was the farmers who... Um, because there was some I uh, like installation oh, yeah, yeah, of right, the military right, yeah, right yeah. nearby because of conflicts between the military and the suspected NPA, mm -hmm. right? And then while well, these farmers were on their farms, uh, they reported being shot at, right? Yeah. And then they had to. Um, I don't think one was killed. No, nah. they were, but one maybe strafe or hit or yeah, whatever. I think one of them was wounded. What is wounded? Yeah. But they were shot at and they just ran. Right. They yeah. ran back to the main barangay. Yeah. Right. So just for context, but the barangay is a like city proper in a sense or the town area where the houses and everything. Mm -hmm. And then their farms, you have to travel out like two yeah, hours or so. Hell right. Far. <laughs> yeah, we went hella far a few times, but then uh, once they ran back. The community was like, yo, what happened? And then they said, yo, we were being shot at. And the, uh, when the military came, they were saying, oh, we shot at you because we thought you were NPA. Mm -hmm. And then it was just like, bro, but, but we, we did, there was no shooting. There was no gun. Nope. There was no threat. No nothing. It was just, and they, the community vetted them like, yo, he's not part of the NPA. He's like, right, he's just a farmer. He's just there. And it was, <coughs> though though there's like conflict on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. What yeah. was um, very pivotal for me was the action of the community because they collectively went to the encampment of the military to say, hey, this is not right. Right. Yeah. I know y'all have your conflicts, right? Legitimate conflicts outside in the surrounding areas and whatnot. But to come into the community and the farm to shoot at these folks with no um, was that aggression mm -hmm. or no like 
initial act yeah. of um, malice, su- or, malice or, or suspicion yeah. is just not right. But what was powerful is all their community leaders went and the community themselves, a lot of them just went and mobilized and showed their support like, yo, this is not right. And since that day, the military has moved their encampment away yeah. and they had they didn't have any more issues with them. It kind of like clicked with me like, yo, that's the power of having an organized community yep. to stand in solidarity against an issue. Yep. Like it's, it's a real life thing where yeah. they were able to address an issue, but only because of their solidarity. Yeah. And it makes me think like, yo, I'd like to get some of that like real cohesion yeah. with communities over here. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it is hard. It is like a challenge to build like that real kapwa. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that because we are in a different system over here. Yeah. We are in a very like which is forced upon us yeah. understandably to yeah. work and to pay our individual bills. Yeah. And it piles on and on. So mm-hmm. it's understandable on some level yeah. because of like look at the houses we're in. Yeah. Right. It's like go into your little box, into your home. Mm-hmm. This is your home. This is your property line and it's not really spaces where it naturally flows where the um, community is naturally created yeah but i know that there are efforts to Mm -hmm. try to build it you know yeah definitely going to mindanao from that what was your experience um we went to zamboanga yeah give me your thoughts oh my first thought was like you know when I found out we were going to Zamboanga, I was like, I'm not going to tell my parents. Right <laughs> Why? You know, because Zamboanga has always had the um, the stereotype of being a very violent area. Huh. Um, you know, I think because it's also associated with a, a large moral population, there's been a lot of like Islamophobic Islamophobic views hmm. of um, that area in general. Um, and so... You know, actually, for me, I was kind of like glad we were able to go to Sambuanga to uh, really see and understand like the conditions there. Um, one thing that really stuck out to me, um, it was towards our end of the stay of the community after we got up there from like that dump truck. Yeah. And then the guy like hella ghosted on us when it couldn't move anymore. <laughs> <laughs> damn, he really left us. I was like, damn. Was that going up? No, no, I was going back down. I was going back down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's because we had that conversation. Uh, I was having a conversation with the Lola, um, who was hosting us that day in, in the morning before we were going to leave. And, um, you know, I think we had asked her, like, like, oh, you know, are you, like, scared of the military coming back? Because um, I know, you know, we, we had done interviews where there are folks who've been harassed since the time of Marcos mm. um, in that community. Uh, you know, and when I asked her, she was like, oh, no, um, you know, we don't fear the military coming here because uh, we're organized. Um, the organizations that have come here, um, Karapatan, the, mm. the human rights organization, mm. um, you know, they've taught us how to organize ourselves. And because of that, um, because we're organized, um, we're not scared. We, we don't have... Um, we don't have a reason to be scared because um, we know that in our that the power uh, lies in our community. You know, very much, si- very similar to like the story you just told for like um, how the community in um, Barangay Kanbaktik uh, was able to mobilize the entire community to get back um, the um, the other farmers who were part of the community from um, the encampment. Mm. And that really hit you as. Like a good representation of like the strength of organizing. Yeah, I think you know it, it really hit me that you know it's not, not just in Sambuanga, not just in Barangay Kanbagtik, not just in the places we visited in Sambales and um, uh, Tarlac and Pampanga, but it really shows that like you know the, the key um, is really in orga- in organizing, um, and you know in you know, I know we have our particular like problems and conditions here, um, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, organizing will be painstaking. Um, it, we really have to put in the effort to really um, unite with other people. 
even if they might have different views from us. Mm. Um, we have to be able to, um, you know, be be able to, um, you know, e- even even if it's just issue by issue, you know, um, and at, you know, at the end of the day too, it's like you know, you know, hopefully building up those unities is something that can, you know, foster something more concrete. Mm. Yeah, and so for just to like transition right mm. what was because i this is perfect because i have a mindanao instrumental that i want to play right but at the end of this trip how was this different or was it the same to your first trip how did you transition back into life here right after the second exposure trip yeah i think i was definitely a lot more grounded i learned my lessons from the first trip so like you know if i felt that you know i was having like an episode it'd be like you know i'm gonna I'm reach out or like okay um you know let's um let's try to like get the, the work moving forward um and it might be like hella gulo and messy and like slow but um you know the work is not gonna do itself mm. um but that you know we also do it collectively you know we 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 should really rely on uh on each other not just one person mm. um and like uh, you know i came in and i mean of course i have different responsibilities um already i mean i wasn't in pace as the as a coordinator anymore but um i felt a lot more grounded in in my role as a regional coordinator for norcal um i felt a bit more grounded and confident in like our ability to like just reach out to other people who like might not know about what's going on or are just looking for for a way to get involved in uh a lot of different things that you know organizations in the, in our community here um can provide for them mm. so because we spoke about Minden now shout out to Salopungan International oh yeah which sets up uh helps set up the indigenous schools in Mindanao for Lumad um communities and they have a few campaigns which is save our schools um and i think currently they are trying to raise money um alongside other organizations to uh set up a school mm-hmm. but they also do campaigns and one of their campaigns was actually using media and they had a song called Mindanao. And I actually have the Mindanao instrumental. So I'm going to put it on. I'm going to give it to you to do your magic and freestyle. Oh, snap. And because I also have to step out and use the restroom to do a tinkle tinkle. So I'm going to put this on. And you can do your magic. All right, brother. All right, I'm going I'm to try. You can do it. <laughs> Thanks for believing in me. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Check. Huh. Yeah. Check. Huh. Bring it back from the Bay to the Philippines. What it do? Oh, yeah. We bounce around from the town and bring it to the Philippines We doing what we doing to make these dreams come true So you know how we do It's one time, yeah, we do it for the youth Uh, over here we representing Kuya Chris over here He went to the bathroom, but you know it's all good I'm spitting to your ear so you hope we'll represent over here Back from the belly of the beast over to the motherland, yeah one time we're representing, so you know how we do. I gotta keep it going. I tie two bows to my head, so you know I gotta bow to the people who came before me, doing their thing to organize, educate, and mobilize communities united to keep doing their thing. And once again, I keep on doing it. Yeah, we keep it moving, so you know we ain't gonna get to it. One time, yeah. Oh, I gotta catch my breath. One time, one time, one time One time, one time, one time Do it for the South, huh? I'ma do it right 
Using my mouth to speak truth into existence I just wanna stop the killing I'll be doing the uh, campaigns Just to get you right onto my brain As I speak all about the different types of ways We can help back to the Philippines Get people out of hell Do it for you and me I just wanna tell what I've seen huh, huh, huh. Beautiful kids call out the Luma They just wanna live huh. Are you are you gonna do something? Are you just gonna keep on moving up in the US of the A Saying that you from the Bay Filipino American in every type of way But you gotta go back huh? Build over a bridge back to the PI In fact, gotta love Gotta help, gotta stop your yelp Everybody just searching for a new restaurant huh? Trying to spend their money, what the fuck do you want? Huh? But people just struggling back in the islands I just wanna use my money to get kids to smiling Maybe I'll throw it back to Mr. Pat He be huh, catching the beat, huh? go on the attack uh, from hey. Mindanao to Central Luzon, we bring it back to the Visayas For the people who touch their lives, doing what we doing through the collective action So you know we uh, go over here and act in the way We gotta bring it back to our communities Building unity to do it and we doing it once again Yeah, we building bridges with our folks over here From Black Lives Matter to freeing Palestine So you know we gotta do it one time Once again we bring it back, yeah from in the now back to the bay So you know what we say One time we doing what we gotta do To organize and amplify to get our folks over here Carrying what we gotta do with the weight of the world All the soldiers so you know uh, We might holler boulders and doing what we doing it Yeah Gotta do it for the islands Get these kids smiling uh. Now they're just going, I just wanna start showing Why the people struggling, maybe we can start hustling and change it now huh? Every Filipino American should go on down to the south, see what's going on huh? People always wanna shout out martial law, but what's really going on? Maybe he got an arm that's strong, but Mr. Duterte, are you right or wrong? Just to be always attacking the poor, not the poor play He says maybe he isn't sure, always Attack and maybe there's people in the back He's just being forced by military action Of course, all the generals were trained by American force Ha, huh, maybe there's something going on Where's the money, where's the cash? Gotta chase that now Maybe we can look into the past How were we just pulled on down? Mending now, huh, my brother path Tell them now, huh, what's going now, yeah. on? What's going, what's going on, what's going on, on? yeah I tell it like Marvin Gaye did To let them know that everything home is over there And the way that the destruction keeps on going with the way They threaten to bomb Lumad schools I'm not with it, so you know we better organize and do it So we better tell Duterte and Trump They better best step the fuck off Yeah, you better recognize the powers in the people's hands Doing what we gotta do so you know they gotta Agitate, organize, and mobilize. Uh, oh my god, I'm running out of lines. Oh god. <laughs> Gotta organize. Hey, shout out to the song Mindanao. It's on salapungan.org. Check them out. Uh, shows the campaign for the Luma communities that have been under pressure. Recently, I heard you. Mentioning in that rap about the threat to bomb Lumad schools. And to understand that those areas are historically under conflict because of the rich land that they're on. Yep. Uh, crazy. Are you, you want to do one more? Another freestyle? Oh, let me. <laughs> let me. Let me see if. I don't know, I don't think my freestyles have been on point yet Hey, they are on point huh? They give me joy <laughs> As I just want you to spit Now you will go on a written after this But we all got some golden views inside of ourselves That's the truth I want us to get out of our own hell uh? Cause sometimes we think we ain't that good But that's not what you should be thinking We are just steadily sinking at times But I will give you an arm to pull you on up The next beat, my brother, it will be all you, huh, drip that gold, dude uh, I'm calling out all my producers Who just make some fire-ass beats Now, it's your turn to speak My G wants to transition Right here 
Yeah, uh, check, huh We got transitions the way that we gotta do and recognize From the way I gotta die so I can go ahead and live So it keep you funky to the way we got the flow So I hope you gonna recognize where we gotta go It's the path of struggle that we walking down So I hope you recognize and take my hand so we can go Nah, it's not the land that we seeking But it's the way the modern Luther King saw from the land And he over there looking up from the mountain So you know we gotta move him with the way we gotta go It's like the way Mal used to talk about it in Five Golden Rays With the way the sun used to shine down uh, Oh my god, I think I got a cough But it's all good cause the damn smoke is all ah. Oh my god I oh keep it God. going though, we keep it moving cause we know that the world ain't gonna stop until it spins off of its axis So you know I don't got access to many of the major elites in the things So you know I gotta keep on moving and I'm living with the way so um, You can catch me down walking on the block in my Janela's to move what I gotta do So I think I'm funky and I'm kinda feeling how I gotta go and I gotta go So I'm talking to the camera So I got Koya Chris over here helping me build up all my confidence So you know I gotta go Once again we sipping tea and I think I need some water but it's all good I'm never thirsty but you know I gotta get what I gotta do Oh my god <laughs> Holy what? <laughs> Gotta what? Uh, uh, used to writing these books. I think my rhymes are corny, but it's all good. You know, it's me and my homie over uh. here vibing out on a good time on an interview podcast. Cool, you Chris doing his thing. I got Chinellas in the back. I right, over here. Oh my god, I'm gonna. Oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> Janellis in the back, oh my god, oh my god, what is he the homie on the track, oh my god, oh my god, shout out to the Mexican brothers, huh? all the sisters who know the Janellis be chocolates, uh, that's how we just get it on down, people of color were beaten cause we brown, but our mamas right on the butt behinds, huh? <laughs> Chinella when I would not admit my lie, that's when I would do something Something bad when I was a kid The belt would come off And I would get hit I'd be like, mama, mama, please don't smack me Oh, fuck, I'm oh my sorry God. My ate was the one who did it <laughs> So I put on the blame huh? But that's what I learned Not to behave What? Pass it off, my brother What's going on? Tell me another verse in a song uh. Another verse in the song And I think that I'm lost But you know, I gotta keep going I went from worker, never boss Cause you know, I keep the roots I gotta push it in the hustle So you know, I never bustle under the pressure I got the weight of the world on my shoulders And you know, it keeps on going And I feel the pressure coming down But it's the community lifting me up So you know, I recognize I can't do it all alone So you know, I bring it home With the way I'm building up with my my family helping me understand why things are way they are so you know I can't figure it out things don't fall out of the sky so you know I gotta know how we got over here and we gotta keep pushing things so you know it's all clear yeah I give it up to my uncle who guided me with the way that I should walk on the path of all the struggle so right now I'm liking where I'm at I might not be perfect but you know yeah, it's your homie Pat. Ah, ha, ah. Homie Pat, homie Pat. My God. Mr. Uma Asa. Homie Pat, homie Pat. Uh, call him Mr. Rasella. Uh, homie Pat. Uh, Uma Asa. Uh, homie, what? Huh? Homie Pat. Uh, huh? That's where they at. And the beat goes crap. Hey! <laughs> okay, cool. So now, can oh you bless us with um, a piece? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a. Should I do the one that I just wrote? Yeah, okay. anything, brother. Anything. We about to get on that artistic tip. Cool. Let me just. I gotta, you breathe, know. Breathe. <laughs> Clear the lungs. Blah 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 la 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 la. <laughs> Boom, boom, boom. The beat goes crap. <laughs> boom, pat. Okay. Kill it, brother. 
cool. I'll tell him, me, Pat, man, you got to stay on point. In between holding it down and keeping it all together, lightweight brothers passing me bottles of brew to celebrate, taking it all in to calibrate where we at. It's all G, maybe it could be just a little bit better. And I know the sign of the times promises to deliver apocalypse because the politics, you was bombing kids out of Serbia, all too familiar. Uh. So I turned to Pamelia when uh. they gutted out Marawi. I hear shots and I close my eyes just to open them and see I'm surrounded on all sides. By my comrades and friends, they all here to break bread and I couldn't be any happier to have my time spent. The front lines is worldwide, we survive, threading relations like roots to the soil. We do work and toil, like the pro leaden peasant, feeling like I'm traveling through dimensions. When we chop game over janks and pollutan. Sinabi mo sa akin na sa ating ang kinabukasan. So you know we better recognize and represent. Because life been feeling like I'm flipping through pages of the family album. I'm cutting the days and nights till mom's back. Cause it's been a while and I feel that I'm needing an extra push. And I know all that money she's sending over covers the food, clothes, and books. So I gotta toughen up, pushing through the way she would. So I better recognize doing what I gotta do. Oh, yeah. Mmm, brah! Give me a little background on where you were at when you were writing that. What inspired it and your mm. process and all. I mean... This, this is still something very, um, I just finished it like a few hours ago. Mm. <laughs> but, um, you know, for, for me, I think it, it's, it, it's been a while since um, I've really worked on like um, just writing. Um, I've been writing since I was in sixth grade. Mm. Um, you know, I think I've always been kind of like perfectionist with it. But it's like, um, you know, with, with this track, I'm kind of relaying like... Um, you know, sometimes like you, you have that one guy at a party <laughs> who kind of gets faded, and when he's faded, all he does is talk to you about like all the political shit and everything that's like wrong in the world. What, is that you? Yeah, that's totally me. <laughs> that's that's totally me. Whether I'm faded or sober, <laughs> but that's also <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just kind of. It, it it was a concept that you know I don't think it's perfect yet, but I, you know I think I'm still trying to like figure out how to like you know tell stories and like really yeah. perfect the craft. What do you when you're saying that? Do you think that's a bad thing that a person who gets faded and just talks all political shit? Oh uh, no no, cause you know it's cool, cause then you know I I, I might do that, but then I also freestyle about it. <laughs> no, mm. but um no no, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, I think anytime you can chop it about chop it up about anything, whether you're faded or sober, um, it's always you know it's always good fruitful conversation that comes out of like, um, you know just just wanting to talk about you know something that's bothering you, mm. and like you know for me I th I feel like a lot of the ills that are happening in the world, um they they bother the hell out of me. Mm. And it's like you know, like I'm not gonna talk to talk about it. Whether you know, it, it's in a place where um I might not be so you know maybe I may be a uh, a bit faded <laughs> or not. Why why do you think like they bother you? Like what is it about like when you think about political things? Why is it resonant <clears throat> with you? Mm. Um, it, it it definitely ties back to like you know in the the the, the injustices in the world today. You know. Um, like, like, I, you know, like through, through the different things that we had talked about, um, on our, on our mission trips, just seeing how people are landless and they're being killed for, um, just trying to like get basic necessities such as like, um, water or just defending their ancestral domains. Um, we see how like, uh, folks in the Arab world, um, they're being bombed through like U.S. instigated attacks um, because they're trying to lift themselves up. Um, we see folks uh, in countries in Latin America like Venezuela that are like trying to uh, fight for their sovereignty who are having like um, outside forces kind of like intervene in the way that they're trying to determine how they want to build up their country. Um, we see um, how... A spur of um, white supremacists here in the U.S. Uh, have been emboldened and are carrying out different tactics to like um, disrupt or even counter um, like Black Lives Matter, um, how they um, dox um, other activists, um, how um, transgender people 
are are killed, uh, especially transgender people of color. They're killed mm. like like very mercilessly. Mm. Um, it's you know, like it runs through my mind all the time. Like it's not a time where I'm not thinking about like these injustices and like you know yeah it's it gets really like overwhelming but at the same time i think it also fuels me because it's like you know this is the fight that we're we're at right now and um yeah we, amidst all these problems um you know what reassures me is that there are people out here who are organizing mm. um you know we may we may or may not be connected yet um, but the fact that there are people who are organizing themselves and their communities uh, speaks to the need uh, to like unite. But like, why do you think that those things are constantly on your mind? Is it like a personality thing? Uh, is it something that really like interests you? Like, is it like? an em empathy type thing taking into account you are also policy right that was your major going mm -hmm. in like what is it about like these larger like issues and movements that like draw you in and draw your attention there yeah. i think it's really uh tied into like my empathy for um for like people who are suffering because of like these larger institutions that are in place that are allowing it or enabling like injustices to prevail um i think part of it is also yeah i'm i'm, I'm genuine generally interested in seeing what's going on i want to uh i want to learn more you know uh, i think for me I've, i'm always been like kind of a curious person i'm not i'm not the type to ask questions but like i'm like if it interests me like i want to like look it up and like see what's up with it um like yeah, I, I think you know, I think it's it's always been ingrained in me when 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 I was a kid from my parents that if I ever see any type of like injustice or people getting wronged, I should never um just stand aside and let mm. things happen. Mm. You think that was ingrained in you because of your parents? Or yeah. Why? What was? Were they like active politically? Were they like? Is it more from a moral, like religious point? Like, yeah. why is that value there? I, I I definitely believe it's more from the moral or religious point. Um, you know, because I mean, both my parents like they weren't very active politically or anything when they were in the Philippines, but I think morally, um, you know, they see and understand that like you know, like something like racism. Like they face racism, they see like black people face racism every day, and it's like, you know, they understand that that's not right. And I think, um, since I was a kid, that 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 that's what was ingrained in me. Cause like you know, the, I think what what was gnarly about that was because at an early age, I kind of saw like how, you know, they wouldn't like outwardly like challenge like you know my auntie or uncle or anything, but it'd be like, you know, asking more. Oh, why do you think that way? Or, like, you know, just not trying to antagonize them or anything, yeah, yeah. but really um, trying to get their point in a way where they can, like, unite better with them, you know? Mm. Yeah. Why? Was your auntie, uncle, like, have a different point of view? Oh, yeah, they're, they're very uh, pro-Marcos. <laughs> oh, okay. So that, so they were trying to, like, build, like, a dialogue between um, your parents who were not? Pro Marcos? Yeah. Oh. Oh, but that's interesting, though, because your parents, though, are Ilocano, right? Yeah. And then, for the most part, Ilocanos are stereotypically pro Marcos, right? Not this one. <laughs> Not this one. <laughs> yeah, like, it's interesting. My family is also, Ilo my dad's side is Ilocano, right? And then, like, when my sister would ask, like, challenging questions, right? And it's interesting to see, like, hmm. Like that kind of stance. Yeah. They're not necessarily pro Marcos because of the dialogues we've had about the negative things, but it is that regionalism. Like, oh, like to focus on the on the progressive thing, like the things that arguably was good done, like infrastructure, this and that. Oh, yeah. but you know the the, the, the you build this in the <laughs> yeah. region. And I think the, yeah, the yeah. the root of it is <laughs> that tribalism, regionalism of like Ilocano, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but 
Oh, that's interesting though. That's good though to have those dialogues within families, especially to be able to have that conversation mm-hmm. about like political issues and all. Cool. Could you give us another piece? Do you have another one you want to share? Oh. Dun, I mean, dun, I, dun, I, I think I can do the one, dun, that one verse dun, that we did dun. for in Eastern Josiah's. Do it, brother. I think that's all I got. <laughs> do it, brother. Cool. I made my way from the city out toward to the countryside to pay a small sacrifice of leaving all I know behind. Marching through the bucket, knowing changes coming soon. Keep the movement fluid, keeping those in mind for whom all we do this for. All the people that we met, that's why we're fighting every day. And there'll never be no rest, cause the weary been suffering, the people been struggling. Against these greedy businessmen who choose to keep plundering the pile up the profits that they're taking from the people. Families go hungry because they can't afford a meal. It's the arms we used to love that we use to defend. That's why we're confident of victory until the very end. So I hope you keep me close like how we do to serve the people. Ngayon ay lumalaban para sa pagbabago. Alam mo na yan kasama. Di matalo-talo. Ang sigaw ang taong bayan. Makibaka wag matakot. There we go, brother. There we go. Um, what was I going to say is, like, I always admired your raps when we would do it. <laughs> like, very, like, centered, very based in your political stance and your call to actions um, for inclusion to do something about it, right? Could you give me your thoughts on that piece? Like, what was your... Where did where were you when you were writing it? Like, what spurred the um, motivation for that piece? Mm. So I I believe of his um we were um I was writing this around like uh our Filipino cultural night in uh 2016. Mm. Um, we had they had the theme of um it was an anti martial law um uh like themed PCN. And so um, they had um, a character who had gone and um, chose to fight against the Marcos dictatorship um, by joining the revolutionary movement. And from there, um, I was like, you know, like in the historical context of of all that happened in the resistance against Marcos, it was the revolutionary movement I, I that I believe that really prevailed and helped topple the dictatorship. Um, and, you know, just kind of trying to see from the lens of like what it takes for, um, you know, sacrificing your life um, to be a part of that revolutionary movement, uh, really giving up and being with the, with the poor, dedicating the rest of your lives for them. And, um, you know, sometimes even making the ultimate sacrifice of, um, you know, uh, being martyred mm. in in the battlefield, um, you know, and, and that's not to glorify or like you know be like you know like be idealistic about, um, you know, that's a reality that happens in the Philippines. Um, it's a reality that still exists today, um, mm. and I thought you know that that would be a good piece to write, um, especially since um, yeah, especially when, when the time we were in the Philippines. Um, that was um, hopeful for the the peace pro- uh, the peace talks between um, the National Democratic Front of the Philippines and the government of the Republic of the Philippines. And those influence <laughs> your writing. And uh, was that the PCN where you were the papa? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> with the comedic relief. <laughs> Where's the pro Marco's dad? <laughs> you were the pro Marco's dad. I was pro Marco's dad. <laughs> oh, Shout no. out to Jordan for that. Oh no! <laughs> Shout out to Jordan and Jericho. Shout oh, out to no. Jordan and Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good PCN. I remember enjoying that one. And it was Janelle who was the one who went off to join. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, and I remember there were good pieces in that one. Was that that was the one with the Luma dance suite mm-hmm. where they had the different regions come together yeah yeah that was a good dope concept Woo. pcns bro pcns are a spot 
but you gotta push it beyond dance yeah shout out to bam shout out to bam <laughs> who called out all the pcns in his last track with on ruby ibarra circa 91 <laughs> shout out to ruby ibarra though bro oh, that circa 91 killed all these whack rappers who just like are lacking in something right everyone's lacking in something now that she's put that out other like dope spitters we missing the flow someone else will be missing like the message some people will be missing the rhyme scheme yo. some people will be missing the beat selection well this homegirl got it all yo with the tagalog and english and what i what i she threw in the what i that was mainly i was oh like my god damn Yo, shows the importance, though, of having the people of color putting out yep. these projects, mm -hmm. and especially a woman, a Pinay, first-generation immigrant, telling her story of what it is to <sighs> immigrate here and to find a sense of home or identity being a Filipino-American. Yep. And it's, it's, it's like... <sighs> Yeah. Mind blowing and raise the bar, yo. Shout out to Beat Rock Music, but no lie, I think she got the best album on that record yeah. label right now. I you gotta elevate my bars. I know. I'm sitting at home like, fuck. <laughs> I've been writing for how many years? <laughs> it's cool. We'll, we'll get it down eventually. I know. One day. One day, Ruby. Thank you, but also like, damn. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. It's high, good. High standard, Raise the bar. Hey, set the high standard for us to really try to get at that. But going back to Bam in one in the line playbills, I believe in the track play uh, uh, taking names or taking names, taking, taking names. names. Um, he says, push that PCN beyond dance. Use that PCN in your college club to build bridges, bridges to the motherland, to the homeland, motherland. Yeah. And it does make you think, like, like, on some level, are we just also culturally appropriating our own, quote unquote, our own culture without being, without it being truly beneficial to the communities where that culture, where that <clears throat> original dance has come from? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think for me on my end, um, considering that, like, you know, I think, you know, this is also the first time that a lot of Filipinos are um a lot of filipino youth are getting like a very heavy exposure as to like what philippine culture is mm. um are you talking about through a pcn yeah through a pcn i mean um you know e even for me like you know when i started out in pace um you know th th that was a focal thing that really got me to see like you know number one what it looks like when a community comes together and does something collectively mm. but then number two it also gave me a sense an idea of, like you know where philippine culture is at um you know, so in, in in one sense, I do agree with that line. I mean, like you know, I think I think you know our organizations can can raise the bar and really um do something concrete with the the art that they showcase. Because at the end of the day, I think the work that they do is also very important. It tells a story, um, that captures a Filipino and Filipino American experience. Um, so it's like a good little nudge and challenge, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, definitely, you know, I think, you know, we all got a starting point for, um, you know, for where we're trying to come from and understand where we come from, whether we were born in the motherland or we were born here in the belly, hmm. but like, yeah, you know, I think that, I think for me, that's one of the most beautiful things about Filipino cultural nights and the way that it's, uh, able to unite, um, everyone to do a very artistic and creative um production that's uh for 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 us in our community mm. yeah mm. <coughs> oh my god <laughs> i remember actually i think it was 2014 either 2013 or 2014 when i just first moved here i watched my very first pcn mm. right because i was not exposed to it in la i was yeah. not exposed to it and Palo Alto, of course. But um, I came here and I was like, oh, PCN. And I watched SF States. And then I remember just like being in awe. Mm. And I cried. I was like, this is beautiful. Just to see the culture on stage of a Filipino-American story of using Tagalog on a nice-ass stage, mm -hmm. right? And then seeing the community, people supporting young and old, right? 
and then using even Tagalog songs. Um, I don't know if you know what uh, PCN it was, but it was like about uh, also a worker, I think, who ended up working here and then falling in love with someone here. I forgot, but that sounds like every other PCN. <laughs> but then they had a mix of singing and then she sang like Bakit Pa by mm. Jessa Jessa oh, Zaragoza. Yeah. That's where I first heard the song too. I was like, what is this? Oh, this is dang. dope. They're singing it on stage. And I teared up. I cried. I was mm. like, yo, this is beautiful. And it is something important. Yeah. Just to put us on there. But it also makes me think in the long run, right? I'm not gonna drop names, but I know this one one group, right, has to pay like eight g's mm, mm-hmm. i think I, it's either eight g's or 16 g's to use the space mm-hmm. that they're using for the night like yo that's a lot of damn yeah. money that like a few thousand like can if it goes to a community in the philippines can do a lot yeah it's just a trip like to think about that but it's that balance right like yeah like realistically for real we are living in the first world is leaps and bounds uh compared to the philippines but mm. where do we stand yeah like how do we use this privilege yeah for communities yeah. like is it something that there's no clear line yeah. too right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah something very hard to navigate you know yeah. like institutions like the university you know um it it's like you know like how come you're like pimping me out of like these thousands of dollars of tuition and our organization still has to pay all this money that we probably already paid for to use this space but can't even use it because we're not a specific group that can be prioritized to use it mm. you know it's like okay then who's this like space really for mm. you know and you know that's not to call out the other like art students or anything or the the other cultural uh groups but it's to really get us to understand the question for whom is this institution for and why is it that some groups are prioritized over others? Mm. I remember that was one of the issues for this last year's PCN mm-hmm. at SF State where they did not have access to the big stage mm-hmm. because it was booked, because <laughs> some other thing was prioritized. They had to break the performances over multiple days yeah. in a smaller um, uh, theater, mm-hmm. right? And it is that like, institutional questioning of like who is it for who is and we gotta be realistic like yeah it's not built for us it's been a space these spaces have been carved out for us to be in it but through organizing efforts and all that like i'll share with you bro i just realized this at cal they have a uh building called barrows hall oh yeah i did not know about this dude david barrows he's the one who set up the colonial education in the philippines and he held very clear racial lines of who's superior and who's not and we're taking classes in this hall called barrows hall just obviously like a questioning of Mm -hmm. damn there we see a legacy of people who are not necessarily the best people, at least on today's standards. Yeah. Right? And it is institutional power, in a sense, and legacy. Yes. And it makes me think, then, now, at our age, what are, what's the legacy we're going to leave? What are you going to leave, Pat? You know, I mean, I mean, for me, I just hope I inspire folks, mm. uh, you know, to like really take things up and really be, um, you know, I, I th- there's a saying that I always go by. Um, it's like, you know, like you can't organize everyone, but everyone can be organized. And it's like, no, yeah, that that's hella real. You know, there are different ways to engage members of our community. You know, some some folks might not want to be activists. Some folks might want to do cultural work. Mm. You know, some folks might have limited capacities because they're working two or three jobs. Mm. Um, you know all these different conditions and whatnot but i think like any contribution that people have to advancing a movement forward uh any type of contribution that can contribute um no matter how small provides a step that can get us closer to achieving an equitable society Mm. um 
and you know so so for me i you know i I just hope that um you know through my actions um that that can you know also help folks see that like things can be done things aren't so far out there that we can't reach for it and mold it into what we into what we uh need for our communities mm. um it really is in our hands what um can you speak a little bit on present day like what are your focuses right now where are your energies like um like like focused on right where are they at so right now uh i'm uh internal vice president for capitan alliance mm. uh right now we, we we just formally launched with uh 31 founding member organizations um this past at the beginning of October. Um, so what we really want folks, um, what, what we're trying to plan out is like, you know, our, our leadership is like very, um, it does, it doesn't just come down from like the executive board or anything. If anything, many of the campaigns, many of the issues that we want to take up come from the people on the ground. Um, and that, you know, We've even had folks from like different areas already who want to wage like different campaigns and they're just, uh, you know, they just want us to help endorse it and discuss it uh, nationally so that we can unite and um, take it up. Um, so right now, like just helping trying to form the um, um, the foundations for the alliance to make sure that um, it's sturdy, uh, sustainable and able to... Um, continue serving our communities could you just give a quick rundown of what kabataan alliance is mm. what was launched and all that mm. so uh kabataan alliance um is a national alliance of uh filipino youth and student organizations across the united states uh we were founded and launched um last october 1st um uh, where we had 31 uh, member organizations uh join us so our mission in essence is to educate uh, unite and act uh, so that we can better serve our Filipino communities. Uh, we know and understand in the era of Trump, we know and understand in the era of Duterte that um, there are many issues that are being carried out that directly affect us as Filipinos from many who are uh, undocumented Filipinos, uh, Filipinos who are just trying to get into higher education, but mm are trying you know it, it's very difficult for them because of the cost of education um having uh you know the, try, try to call for a stop for like the drug war in the philippines because of all the young people who've already been killed um and the countless uh thousands of other um victims who were um killed without due process um you know even like supporting um other uh oppressed and marginalized groups you know we don't want a muslim ban you know we don't want uh women and lgbtqi groups to be um subjected to the violence of the u.s government and other hate groups um you know as an alliance we want to be able to stand firm stand with our community stand with other oppressed and marginalized communities to be able to um just really be firm and strong in um saying like you know we won't let you bully us we won't let you take our communities and make us feel that we're powerless because we understanding our history and what we've done from the time of datu lapu lapu to the time of uh the um the katipunan to the time of like the anti-martial law activists to the time of the delano manongs to today um that we're still active and that we're still doing work and that that legacy is being carried forward by us today. Mm. Today we are, uh, I mean, I mean like, you know, I don't want to say it like, you know, we are, we are the Larry Leongs. We are the Gabriela Silangs. We are the Lorena Barroses. But in the same sense, it's like, you know, we're not the exact same person. We're mm. carrying out the work that um, they've put forward. And for us as the, as the new generation, now it's our time to carry forward and uh make the change that needs to happen mm, mm. why yo i'm just gonna give you props for like i see the um sincerity in your voice to like 
further the struggle and uh, further the um, fights of those who have come before us, right? Why is it? Why, why, why? I just want to know, like, what has given you that fire and how come you have really embraced these um, experiences and these stories of those who have come before us to be the present day Lariat Leongs who have, um, so, who serve their community. Yo, I'm inspired by everyday people. Yo, I mean like how y'all went to the Philippines and served the people in Marawi in the evacuation centers this past summer. I was like, damn, like, you know, we have folks who are really on the ground who know what's up and what's going on, who can bring something back and let folks know what's going on in Marawi. Um, you know, we've, We've organized campaigns for relevant education by, you know, it might have been drafted by um, by a politician to like push for AB one two three, but it was really the students and the youth who pushed that forward. I've seen workers win their wage theft claims, uh, from uh, companies and employers who have taken away their wages from them, um, who have suffered for such a long time because they felt scared. But then we're empowered by organizations like the Filipino Community Center and Migrante. Um, I see how like students who have always enjoyed um, the ability to take uh, classes, ethnic studies classes, come to the defense of ethnic studies, whether they're from K through 12 or um, the college level, who have stood to defend ethnic studies by whatever means that they could. I've seen uh, just people who uh, stand up for uh, different, uh, like the Palestinian people who have always been subjected to marginalization because of their very identity as a Palestinian, um, for people to unite with them and see that they're able to prevail and go forward and exist. Um, there, I'm just, you know, I'm I'm just very inspired by like, you know, when, when, when we really talk about, you know, that saying, no history, no self, mm. I think um, what we really garner from that is that, like, when we know our history, you know, it's really a guide for us to carry out the action. Mm. You know, um, m many, many times I feel like sometimes, um, you know, I think reading books is important. I think studying and doing academics is important. But at the same time, our education does not just like end in the classroom or start in the classroom. Um, all these people like, you know, Gabriela Silang, uh, Lorena Barros, um, Larry Itleon, Philip Veracruz, you, countless other like folks I know from the different organizations that SF stayed in around the country. They've put in the work. They know what the problems are and they know what they can do to solve it. And that's why I continue to like, you know, stand firm by this, you know, um, it's something that, um, you know, you know, you're not alone. Mm. There are millions of us. We may, we might, we, we may have not yet met, but you know, hopefully down the line we will, but there are people all over the world who are carrying out these types of work to be able to, um, exist, to live in a free and just society. Mm. It seems like it's, uh, real honest desire to impart change onto the world that like you've seen the struggles of a lot of different groups that you've but at the same time you've also seen the efforts to address those problems and address those issues hey that's it's beautiful man but i want to ask though like because i know it's not an easy thing to be organizing it's not an easy thing to even just get you can get caught up even yeah. in the logistics of freaking meetings <laughs> yeah right <laughs> like taking notes and stuff right but what has been like throughout your time of coordinating and you know, student groups or even outside of uh, campuses what has been a struggle um and what has kind of gotten you through that i definitely think a struggle is like um you know, j just trying to recenter myself and really um, focus during times where I find myself like really like my good look. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, you know, you know, like for example, like, you know, like with me recently graduating, you know, I think I fell into like a kind of funk, you know, I felt like depressed again. 
Um, and, you know, you know, also kind of taking the lessons from when I came back from the first trip. You know, what really got me through was like being intentional, how to um, reach out, um, be with people who I care about um, and really challenge myself to also reach out to people who, you know, I feel ashamed because I haven't, you know, been with them in like a long time, you know. Um, the other part too is like self-preservation, right? I mm. think I've always had like a, uh, an unhealthy lifestyle. You know, I eat very unhealthy foods. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, it's, it's real. Like, you know, if we talk about wanting to wage like struggle, if we talk about wanting to wage a movement or a revolution or whatever, um, you really have to be, you know, you can be sharp here too. You can be sharp in carrying out your work, but if you're not sharp in like taking care of your body, then like you know that that uh in the end you're gonna have a shorter time, mm. like um like uh carrying out that work. So you know in in the midst of all this too, I'm learning how to um figure out how to be better at self preservation, mm. um being able to. You know, not, not only just take care of myself, but also have others, like, you know, we, we take care of each other. Mm. Yeah. And what specifically has given you, like, that stability to learn that those self-preservation tactics and even learn how to enter those spaces of taking care of each other? Because sometimes it's hard to even know, like, what to do for self-care, self-preservation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that. Especially when you're thrown into everything that you yeah. have to get done, right? School, <laughs> organizations, work, and all that. You know, I think one thing that um, I, I think it starts with eating, right? Um, so one thing that, like, you know, of course, the cost of food is very expensive, um, and like even the time that it takes to cook, sometimes it can be very consuming. Mm. Um, one thing that my roommate and I you know, <clears throat> we've been trying to plan this for a long time, but even just like, you know, collective grocery shopping, collective cooking, um, you know, because, because um, I think we, at least for me, I have an understanding now that um, what you put into your body really determines what will happen to it. So it's like, you know, if you put too much sugar, it's like, you're not going to feel good. You eat too much fat, you're going to feel awful. Like, you got to balance that out and really... Like, you know, you got to eat that gulai. You got to eat, eat that fruits. Gulai. <laughs> eat you that really, gulai. You know, stuff. like, replace that steak with some fish. Uh. And so you've been really realizing that and how it affects you mm-hmm. and, like, in the different aspects of your life? Yeah, because, you know, it, it doesn't just manifest, like, physically. Um, You know, it also manifests, like, uh, mentally, you know? Mm. Like, mentally sluggish. Like, you know, not being able to, like, you know... Waking up in the morning and already feeling like, ah, I don't want to do shit. Mm. I want to transition a bit and ask you about your work at FCC with mm-hmm. Kapataan right yeah. now. Because uh, you started that this year? Yes, I did. Uh, you started that this year. And Kapataan is a beautiful space that's, that has a special place in my heart, seeing youth go through that and then mm-hmm. be older now. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're old! <laughs> Oh, we're old. But no, we're not old. <laughs> <laughs> how has the transition in been? And how has it been being in that space as a youth coordinator? You know, I came in feeling like, oh, shit, am I, am I cool enough? <laughs> 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 but that was my first thing. I was like, oh, God, I hope these these uh, these high school kids think I'm cool enough. Because then, like, I don't want them to be like, oh, cool, your pet's hella lame. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but 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 on the real, I think, you know, it, it's my first time working with high school youth in a very, um, in a more focused and intimate way. You know, I've always worked with college students, um, at least in the, like, you know, the different organizations. You know, it's, it's totally different. Um, but at the same time, I think what I enjoy is just, just how honest, like, they are. Like they they really no holds barred if they don't like anything they will let you know straight up or like if they do like something they like they'll give you props for it or like you know and I think that's what I what I've been like trying to like like figure out right now is like how can I like really like effectively engage like high school youth because hmm. it's like yeah I'm new and stuff 
and it's like but i want to like you know really learn how to um really genuinely build with them also because like yeah i mean at the end of the day yeah it's a job um <laughs> but you know i don't want to half-ass it you know yeah yeah, like, yeah. i really you know really want to build and connect yeah and really um you know understand where they're coming from what have you learned to in terms of connecting with the youth and seeing and un- understanding them what well, has the <laughs> like the lesson process been the, you know like contrary to like you know what i first brought up it was like no nah, you know i just need to be myself mm. like i don't gotta like be another person like you know like they they want to be there because, like, you know, I'll bring whatever vibe that I bring with it, you know. It's not going to come if I come with, like, your vibe or, like, Pele's vibe or, you know, other folks, you know. So, it was like, you know, part of it is also, like, you know, I should be comfortable with myself. Hmm. But also in the sense where it's, like, you know, because you got to have some of those boundaries sometimes, like <laughs> educator <laughs> and stuff. Boundaries. You know, it's like, I can't have you, like, cussing and, like, fighting each other and stuff. <laughs> But it's like, no, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it's always um, when I reflect on being in spaces with the youth, there's something about the youth that it's, it's invigorating and it's healing. It's, I think like the older we get, the more institutions we are in and the more that we almost have to mold ourselves to fit expectations of different spaces, especially academic spaces, that at least for me, once I'm in these like after school sessions mm-hmm. where the youth is more engaged to do more creative things and yeah. given that space, yo, it's so invigorating and it's so like, I feel like... Like a kid again like i yeah. want to be just like this lively and honest and mm-hmm. even just open yeah at times and it makes me think like fuck what are we doing with in these other spaces that are trying that are very like best word oppressive to the youth yeah that they're like sit down do your fucking work mm-hmm. and get these grades and all that shit where they're like fuck where where's the life going yeah and that's why i highly respect um spaces like kabataan yeah. <clears throat> and having those you know for them to like have that growth and have that space to be themselves because they are the future leaders. Yeah. I met some Somcan youth. Shout out to South of Market. Johanna. Yo- Johanna. 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 This Friday, they have an open mic, Ignite Open Mic. Um, but they're also like raw in mm-hmm. terms of I saw them perform yeah. their poetry at Role's, um album release mm-hmm. party like it's real shit it's not like on layers of trying to stunt or trying to be th- like look at me with my wordplay like that no nah, it's their real emotions mm-hmm. and real experiences yup that I would love to have more of us speak on that right Damn, bro. Do you have another piece? I see you flipping through this this book. Do you have another thing you want to share? I I don't know. Um, a little bit of that written, or do you want to go on to the freestyle? Do uh, two more two more beats or so before I ask you for my last. There's a I can do like one more beat before I have this last section that I want to go over. Freestyle. Or written. I'll, I'll do this written. Okay, go, go, go. <laughs> I don't feel confident in my freestyle no, abilities right then, now. Then that means we got a freestyle after then, All after right. this. <laughs> so, okay, go get it, brother. All right. So we'll go, goddamn, Uncle Sam. The red, white, and blue back at it again. Keep oh. your goddamn hands off my family and friends. I see you making all your rounds, bro. You ain't slick. They want to do a brother dirty like Kaepernick. Oh. Keep my head down. I could never submit. But I get it, though, fam. You got to feed the kids. Red sky rocket in salary diminished to kick down the door because you're making all this living. So, you know, how you going to tell me I'm really the villain? When goddamn Uncle Sam is the one doing the killing, operating in the hood like an occupying army. I take it from the pages of the Black Panther Party, relaying all the messages. I hope that you see that the answers that you've been looking for have always been with you, G. 
Oh, calling out Uncle Sam on that one, son. <laughs> Goddamn, Uncle Sam. Goddamn, Uncle Sam. Oh, Tito Boy. <laughs> no. Tito Boy, Terte. <laughs> we. We, joke lang. Grabe. Grabe, don't get at me. This is joke lang, ha? <laughs> My name is not Chris. <laughs> Do not target me. I am just a joker. <laughs> But I guess we gotta put on this freestyle, build that confidence. You feel it? Let's do it. Okay. This is shout out to producer Drip Gold. He's from SoCal, Long Beach area. This is his loose cat. His. Wait. And a restart. All you, brother. You gotta start it off. Yeah. Check. I take it where I'm coming from and try to bring back all the therapy and know that I recognize that you know I got the GMB yeah. doing what I gotta do. Shout out to the folks in SoCal who made up this beat. Yeah. yeah. I'm coming from the 925 all the way live. I'll bring it to the 415 where we at right now. So I keep it going and going from everything that I learned from the days that I used to be an adolescent. Wanted to. Fucks with the gangs, but you know I couldn't do it When my uncle came in and said, nah, bruh, you screwing it yeah. So I gotta go and make my moms and pops proud, yo But nah, I could never do that 9 to 5 inside a cubicle I'd rather be outside with the people So you know I gotta organize, I'm doing my thing In the Excelsior in San Francisco State All my folks over there <coughs> Coughing up great, ah, he got it so sick, his verse is so slick, making him throw on some saliva shit, drinking water, now he gonna get back, gonna give you all, all that musical rap, huh? A musical rap with the way that I was, well, musical rap with the way I was with my upbringing, the way my uncle used to play me, all them slaps from Snoop Dogg to Tupac to Biggie, you know where it's at, I wish to be that chubby kid on the block doing my thing, I kept to myself, I put up in my brain with all the books that I read, I keep on doing, so you know, with the relationships I build, I keep it genuine, I'm building with my folks, so you know that we building up societies and generations of all these people, so they can take care of the earth they could know all of their worst so they yeah. know they could never recognize the colonizer who told them to stab themselves in the heart so you know you can never tear us apart like the cedula andres bonifacio did it at the cry of pugat lawin so you know huh we ain't lying over here over here in daily city with kuya chris and we doing our thing uh, i gotta get this kawali out of my heart and get a bit healthier so you know i gotta keep it yo i gotta get all this belt off so you know it's getting healthy skelter with the way that trump is over here with the administration of his policies kicking out the muslims but nah we defending all of our peoples from here back to the motherland we doing it we go hella ham so you know it's mania out here Shout out to my G's I see all my family over there Overseas I see all my folks over here Trying to get by with honest living So you know Oh I don't know But you know I still got love for y'all When you're doing your thing It's been a minute But you know I gotta link up And know what's going on with my fam So you know where I am So I let them know that I'm here Ready to fight for where they at So I got my folks over here I hope you recognize all my love for you It's what keeps me going and flowing So you know I might not be perfect With the raps or the hat But I gotta let you know That I got all of you on my back So you know I recognize that I gotta keep on going For the youth All the kabata And I see you uh, uh, uh. Oh my god Shouting out the youth Kabata They the truth I huh. gave you everything I could uh. I gave you everything I could. I just ain't ready for uh, this. I nah, ready nah, for this. ain't ready, ain't ready. Sometimes we give it all up. Sometimes it's a little I bit tough. I told you everything I knew. Uh, I, I, knew. I watched the way that you grew. Damn, I forgot who he sampled on this one. Uh, yeah, yeah, swipe. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Come on. I gave it, I showed you, I did it, I know you 
Huh, gonna be a king, gonna be a leader You youth, you gonna swing, you the truth To the youngins, I hope you get into the booth And start rapping, start giving us the trapping I just want to know what's really going on Put your life into a song, my G Yee, yee <laughs> uh, So wait, okay, two things actually Because of that, can you share You should, You bring him up a lot Can you tell me a little bit about your uncle? You seem to really like be grateful for the good that he like. You mentioned him a while ago about say, taking you. Hey, don't get into that gang shit. But even um, chopping it up about playing Snoop Dogg for you and all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, my 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 uncle. I mean, in, the, in our family, he wasn't really kind of like looked upon as like the ideal like. Goya or Manong in the family, you know, because like you know he um well, well he never graduated from high school um he um because he was part of like those barcadas um you know he he got set up and was like institutionalized he was put in jail um on false uh false charges of carrying like um assault weapons and like you know eventually he was able to like uh get out but you know I think after that like you know because of like the mark of the institution, um, you know, him, you know, being seen as a felon, right? That that fucked up his life. You know, he wasn't able to get a job um, that was, like, able to, like, really, like, sustain himself, you know? And, like, you know, unfortunately, because, like, he did live a, you know, a very unhealthy lifestyle, you know? Um, he, he didn't take care of himself. Like, a lot of the food that he ate was really bad for him, you know? Unfortunately, he passed away, like, at the age of 27. And, like, you know, I also take that as a lesson too, you know, like, no, nah, like, you know, when I was talking about self-preservation a while ago too, that's what I was really thinking about also. It's like, you know, how long do I want to be here? How long do I want to fight? You know? Um, so like, you know, for, for everything that he's given me in his life and in his death, like, it's really like, no, nah, like, you know, I, I got, you know, there are these points that got, that really make me see like, you know, you, you gave me what I needed, you know, in terms of my education, you gave me the starting point of like what I I needed for myself. Mm. And like, in, 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 and this also goes in the same sense with like my health, you know? Yeah. Damn, it's beautiful to hear how like, like a story of someone like in your family who is viewed negatively mm -hmm. quote, quote, right because yeah. it doesn't fit into that good role model but has <clears throat> been something pivotal in your life both like the good that he has done to tell you hey don't get into that gang shit but also learning from his mistakes mm -hmm. and even uh, the the mortality of life hey, yo it's beautiful thanks for sharing yeah yeah most that definitely. shit real that yeah. shit's real especially when you see it in your family sometimes those are the hardest to like take but also the most pivotal mm -hmm. right? yeah of like what not to do no damn bro here and i'd like to end it with and this is a good transition in terms of having a mentor right um could you give me three pieces of advice that you would give in general to like a younger self mm -hmm. maybe it could be like the kid who you know, has some connections with filipino stuff but um is not politicized in that way or um is thinking about like joining this and that that might be like a gang because that's a cool thing to do or even the youth the youth organizer who be just getting into um organizing and all or even to the um youth who came back from the philippines or is going through these like isolated feelings of depression mm -hmm. because not knowing how to reach out or things yeah. like that just things in that reflection okay, mm -hmm. give me some pieces of, three overall pieces <clears throat> of advice for so i think uh number one definitely is um don't be afraid to uh to speak up <laughs> You know, I think I think a lot of times, right? Like, um, wh whether we're in school or amongst friends, you know, whatever dynamic, you know, whatever. Th there's always a dynamic that will, you know, because I I used to be the quiet kid, right? Um, there's always that dynamic that like makes us feel like, oh, we can't speak because, you know, I'm not important enough, or, 
you know, I don't have a voice like, uh, oh, I don't have a voice like Kuya Pat, right? It's like, nah, like, you know, like, anything that you say and anything that, like, you, you know, really hold in your heart and really want to, like, express, like, whether it's reaching out for help or, like, feeling like you need encouragement for, like, your art pieces or whatever, um, it's to really, like, you know, speak up, like, don't let, like, it's also like, you know, don't let you, don't stop yourself from stopping yourself. Don't let yourself stop yourself. Mm. Yeah. So speak up. That's the first one. Yeah. Um, I think, I think number two is like, don't let, don't let yourself stop yourself. Don't let yourself stop yourself. Cause, oh, okay. Cause, um, I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of times, you know, I think self doubt can really cripple you mm. and like really, um, or maybe, well, I don't want to use cripple as like, but like, you know, it, it can like make you feel that like you can't do anything mm. because of like whatever, like, oh, like I'm not good enough because of that. Or like, you know, I don't think like I should do this because like whatever, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, like, you know, we, we have like, we have power over ourselves, you know, like, so whether like, you know. You're you're scared to ask the person you admire and let them know that like you like them. Or even um you know, just like asking for help on your math test to study for it or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like well, no, nah, like yeah, I should reach out and like, you know, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Um and then lastly, um I think um um, make some time to reflect mm. um, and not in the sense of like because there are different ways to reflect right but like I think sometimes we think of reflection as something that's isolated Um, you know just in our room uh, or like you know and you know I think there's a time and space for that too right mm -hmm. but like, I, I think also Reflection and being with like your community, like I don't know, it, I don't know if that's like the right phrasing, but it was like, remember like during the cultural night when like uh, free, like the 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 high school group was like hella rapping. I was mm -hmm. like, oh damn, mm -hmm. like I'm hella like, oh I'm like hella vibing to this right now. Mm -hmm, I'm hella mm -hmm. inspired and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's like. Dang, I don't even know what I'm trying to say for number three. <laughs> it sounds like if I could try to get at least a message that came across to me is like have that sense of reflection on life, but also know that it's not an individual thing only. Like you can reflect and find um, insight from being within a group and a community. Yeah. If it's, it's like find your reflection in, in, in your people. Mm. Boom! Ooh, that was dope. That was a good one. Find your reflection in your people. Hey, that's that kapwa shit. It's like really seeing yourself in others and being able to reflect. Um, if I'm getting right, reflect even the struggles or work through to find answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all that. Yeah, like it is. It can be powerful to have a collective process. Yeah, with all that. No, oh, brother. <sighs> Thanks for coming on. Do you have any last messages for the youth, for people who are listening? For the for my two listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for inviting me. No um, you know, thanks for coming yeah. on. If, if there are folks who uh, want to get more involved or anything um, through whatever, um, you can follow different platforms um, for Kapatan Alliance stuff. If you, mm -hmm. your organization, are interested in joining the alliance you can just go to kabataanalliance.org that's k a b a t a a n kabataanalliance.org mm -hmm. and you can click on um membership or uh, join as a member mm -hmm. and um yeah we we can uh set up an orientation for you and your organization join our alliance and let's do that good work you know mm. Your Instagram is Pagasa Pat. Yes, it is. What does Pagasa mean? Hope. P A G A S A 
P A T. Why do you pay, why do you make it pagasa? No, because sometimes I feel hopeless, and it's like nah, there's hope mm. in yourself, and there's hope in in the people that are around you. Where do you look for hope when you feel hopeless? I look to people like you. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, like when you feel down sometimes, like what has given you hope, and where what has sparked sparked it, or where do you go? Like knowing that you kind of need that little refresher. Yeah, you know, I I just hit up like um like many of the folks that I mean like a lot of the folks who I work with at the Filipino Community Center. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, we're coworkers, or, but like you know, at the same time, I think you know we have a that's our defined relationship as coworkers. But um, I think because many of them have been in like the different organizations, and we have a an understanding of like connection with one another um yeah you know i really like i hang out with them i like you know ask them for advice and stuff um you know i i really like you know talk to my little brother because mm. um for me I, I love my little brother mm. shout out to adrian and rosella adrian rosella oh <laughs> uh, nah, yeah you. he's um he's really um he's my best friend mm. um you know, he's helped me get through a lot of my tough times. He's helped me, like, really level things off and try to look at things in a in a level-headed manner before, like, making a decision. Mm. Um, you know, he he's someone, like, you know, if I can float off, he's someone who will just, like, help ground me mm. back in a lot of, like, what's going on. Mm. It's beautiful to hear, to even remember that, help can be from those younger than us yeah and even like i've experienced that like damn this who is wise for being younger than me you know like it isn't only just a strict age as yeah. mentorship and all that damn that's beautiful thanks for sharing your passion your insight and everything brother join capitan alliance go to the philippines this upcoming summer there's gonna be a trip 2018 yeah, most likely. Yes. I mean, we'll, we'll, uh, we're still trying to fine tune that out, uh -huh. but uh, we definitely want to make that happen. Yes, yeah. KavataanAlliance.org. Oh. And then um, also for the victims of the North Bay fire, I mm. mean, right now um, we are collecting donations through NAFCON US, NAFCONUSA.org. Mm. Um, we're also trying to see if we can um, coordinate relief missions to the different evacuation centers mm. for the victims of the fire. So if there are folks who are interested in that, um, check out our Facebook page at Capitan Alliance. Um, check out uh, NAFCON USA. Um, you know that's N A F C O N. Yes, National Alliance of Filipino Concerns. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it'll be all on their page yes. NAFCONUSA.org. Yes, dope. Yee. Salamat, brother. Daghang salams. Daghang salam. Satanan. <laughs> Satanan. <laughs>